The American submarine USS Sculpin was running fast on the surface in the darkness, the diesels throbbing as the grey-painted vessel surged through the dark Pacific waters in a race her skipper was determined to win. Commander Fred Conaway and his seasoned crew of 54 men were all veterans of the war in the Pacific. It was the ninth war patrol for the boat that had first entered naval service in 1939 the men quietly and confidently going about their jobs as submariners as they had so many times before. It was the night of the 18th to 19th of November 1943, and out in the darkness somewhere far ahead was a big Japanese convoy north of the huge 4th Fleet anchorage at Truk, where Japanese ships and military reinforcements had been departing towards the Gilbert Islands and the American invasion of Tarawa. The Sculpin, with its squat conning tower, four anti-aircraft machine guns, and forward-mounted three-inch deck gun, along with two other American submarines, was converging upon the convoy at full speed, determined to achieve good firing positions by first light on the 19th. The three submarines would be acting in concert with one another, and aboard the Sculpin, Captain John P. Crumwell was tasked with commanding what the U.S. Navy termed a submarine-coordinated attack group, otherwise known by its more common German derivation of Wolfpack. It was vital that the submarines attack and sink as many Japanese transports and cargo ships as possible to prevent them from reinforcing Tarawa before the Americans came to liberate the island. Hence, Captain Crumwell, at 42 years old and old man aboard the Sculpin, was urging Conaway to run his submarine fast down the radar bearing towards the swift-moving convoy. Undoubtedly, in Commander Conaway's mind, was the recent run of torpedo malfunctions he had suffered on the preceding war patrol along the Chinese coast, which had brought Japanese escorts down upon his boat on several occasions. The previous patrol had begun well for the season's sculpin. Conaway had sunk the Japanese transport ship Seko Maru on the 9th of August in the Taiwan Strait, and had managed to evade strong anti-submarine forces on the 16th and 17th of August. Four days later, Conaway had discovered a small Japanese convoy and launched three torpedoes at a selected target. For some unknown reason, all three torpedoes had failed to explode, and instead his attack had alerted Japanese escorts that had flung a hail of depth charges after the escaping Sculpin. On the 1st of September, another torpedo malfunction had brought a further furious depth charge assault down upon the submarine. These mechanical failures played on Conaway's mind as his boat continued on its meeting with destiny. As light filtered into the sky in the early morning of the 19th of November, the lookouts on the bridge confirmed what the radar operator had already reported. A line of ships labouring along at speed, sleek destroyers marshalling their flanks and rear of the convoy like eager sheepdogs. The Sculpin closed up for action, Conaway bringing his boat into a firing position on the surface as the range decreased between the low submarine and the oblivious Japanese convoy. Suddenly, one of the lookouts gave a cry of alarm as a destroyer suddenly swung about and began to bear down on them. The conning tower was cleared and its hatches swung shut to the tune of dive, dive, dive over the boat's intercom, the Sculpin slunk beneath the waves and managed to evade the attentions of the searching destroyer. The sonar operator reported the convoy changing course and after manoeuvring his boat into a new position, Conaway brought the Sculpin back to the surface behind the convoy, hoping for better luck. Unfortunately, the American submarine popped up only 600 yards from the Japanese destroyer Yokohama guarding the rear of the convoy, forcing Conaway to crash-dive the Sculpin almost immediately. The first string of depth charges, known derisively to the crew as Ashcans, detonated out of range of the submarine, but the Japanese got the depth right on their second attack, the Ashcans throwing the submarine around, knocking out her depth gauge in the process and causing much minor damage. Conaway decided to bring his boat back up to periscope depth, but with a defective depth gauge it was very difficult to judge his ascent, and as the Sculpin broached the surface, the Japanese destroyer came about for another attack run. 
Conaway ordered his boat back beneath the surface, but a hail of 18 ash cans rocked, jarred and blasted the submarine's pressure hull, causing considerable further damage. The crew lost control of the submarine as it began a plunge into the depths, soon running beyond its safe depth. Pipes burst and rivets popped like gunshots as icy jets of seawater pumped into the boat in every compartment. The situation looked grim as the officers and men flayed around waterlog compartments, attempting to stem the ingress of the sea that would kill them all. The only way to maintain depth was to run the submarine at full speed, aiding the Japanese to track and continue to depth charge the boat. Already leaking like a sieve and almost out of control, further Ashcan detonations now poked out the submarine's eyes, destroying the Sculpin's sonar equipment. Commander Conaway faced a terrible decision, either stay down and be slowly blown to pieces by the Yokohama above, or surface and fight it out in an unequal battle. No one relished the prospect of surrendering to the Japanese, especially one man aboard her. Captain Crumwell, as well as coordinating the American wolf pack attack on the Japanese convoy, was also in possession of top-secret information concerning the details of the forthcoming invasion of the Gilberts. He knew that he could not be taken alive when the time came. Blowing all tanks, the Sculpin came to the surface, the deck gunners running to man the submarine's small artillery piece while the decks were still awash. The Yokohama bore down upon them, guns blazing, while some of the crew still inside the submarine set scuttling charges to prevent the vessel's capture by the Japanese. A shell from the Japanese destroyer tore into the conning tower, killing Conaway, Lieutenant Joseph de Vries, Jr., and the entire bridge watch, and raking the gunners with shell fragments. The senior surviving officer informed Captain Crumwell that he was scuttling the sculpin, Crumwell electing to stay with the vessel as she took her final dive. Everyone else who was still alive was ordered to abandon ship. In Crumwell's citation for a posthumous award of the Medal of Honor, it read in part, Determined to sacrifice himself rather than risk capture and subsequent danger of revealing plans under Japanese torture or use of drugs, he stoically remained aboard the mortally wounded vessel as she plunged to her death. Forty-two officers and men plunged into the sea as the sculpin slid beneath the waves, many of them wounded. The destroyer Yamagumo hove to, and the Japanese crew began hauling the exhausted and terrified men aboard. The Japanese quickly indicated their contempt for the American submariners, first rescuing and then throwing back one critically injured man. Rounded up on the deck of the destroyer, the Japanese robbed the Americans of anything of value and bound their hands behind their backs. The Yamagumo immediately sailed to truck with the bedraggled prisoners, where a Toketai naval police unit awaited their arrival for questioning. Arriving at truck on the 20th of November, 13 of the American sailors were separated from the main group of Sculpin survivors and herded into a small cell on Dublon Island. The jail consisted of three cells opening onto a small courtyard between a road and the water's edge. The men were subjected to fearsome beatings with rifle butts and wooden clubs, and even though several were wounded before they were captured, no medical attention was provided. Naturally, the Toke Tai wanted the kind of information that Captain Crumwell had taken with him to his watery grave, but none of the survivors possessed any strategic data of any significance to aid the Japanese in preventing the American invasion of the Gilberts. Some of the American prisoners received extremely severe treatment, including three wounded sailors who had legs amputated without anaesthetic and another who was forced to stand at attention for 48 hours. After 10 days of mistreatment and torture, the Japanese divided the survivors into two groups, assigning the prisoners to the aircraft carriers Chuyo and Unyo for transportation to labor camps in Japan. By a strange twist of fate, the Chuyo was torpedoed just outside Tokyo and sunk by the USS Sailfish, originally named the Squalus, the submarine the Sculpin had helped locate and raise four and a half years earlier, when the boat had sunk while working up in 1939. The crew had been rescued by a special recovery vessel where the Sculpin had chartered the area and assisted in the rescue effort. 
Of the 21 Sculpin survivors held aboard the Chuyo, only one survived the sinking, saving himself by grabbing hold of a ladder draped down the side of a passing Japanese destroyer. The other 21 prisoners aboard the Unyo were delivered to the Ofuna prison camp on the 5th of December 1943, and another dose of severe questioning. Eventually released from interrogation, the battered Americans were put to work as slave labourers in the Ashio copper mines for the rest of the war, with many of them not surviving. Many thanks for tuning in. Please do visit my video channel, Mark Felton Productions. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.